On May 3, 2022, at the small Calhoun County Airport in Florida, four people climbed into a Cessna 172, a sheriff's lieutenant, two friends, and a young man filming from the back. Minutes after takeoff, the plane crashed and erupted in flames. Two of them survived. The pilot was experienced, the weather was perfect, and the engine sounded fine. So how does a calm afternoon flight turn fatal just seconds after liftoff? What the survivors told investigators and, and what the NTB later confirmed exposed a single deadly mistake that doomed the flight before it ever left the ground. The man flying that day was William Randy McCrone, 56 years old, a respected Calhoun County Sheriff's lieutenant and helicopter pilot. He wasn't new to flying. His logbook listed around 575 hours. This was someone who had experience, discipline, and a good reputation. Beside him sat Steve Mears, 48, a close friend, and in the back were Randy's son, Grayson, and family friend, Devin Farrell. It wasn't a formal flight, just a casual afternoon ride, showing the guys around the kind of short hop every pilot has done a hundred times. The airplane was an older 1957 Cessna 172, four seats, full tanks, and a max gross weight of just 2,200 pounds. That's not much when you think about four grown adults in full fuel. Still, it had flown fine before. The weather was clear, but hot, around 31 degrees Celsius or 88 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot air means thinner air, and thinner air means less lift. It's the kind of subtle factor that makes performance margins shrink without anyone noticing. Witnesses around Calhoun County Airport watched the takeoff from runway 36. The little Cessna lifted off smoothly, but right away, something looked off. The nose pitched high, too high. The airplane seemed to hang there, climbing sluggishly, struggling for altitude. One witness described it like it was just fighting to stay in the air. Moments later, the plane started a slow left 270-degree turn, never climbing above treetop level. It drifted across the end of the runway, disappeared behind a hangar, and then a rising column of black smoke. The sound of impact was followed by fire. At that exact moment, the physics of the airplane, not bad weather, not bad luck, had already turned against them. Now let's break down what actually happened aerodynamically. From the outside, it looked like a smooth takeoff that just didn't go up, but the data and the wreckage tell the real story. The airplane lifted off with a nose-high attitude, meaning it was pitched steeply upward, but the airspeed wasn't keeping up. In other words, the plane's angle of attack, the angle between the wing and the relative airflow, was already flirting with the critical limit. When McCrone began that left 270-degree turn, things got worse. Turning at low speed increases wing loading. The inner wing travels slower and loses lift first. Once the inside wing stalls, the airplane drops and starts to roll. That's the beginning of a stall spin. And at a few hundred feet above the ground, there's no recovery space. Investigators later confirmed from ground scars and wreckage, nose low, right wing down impact, a tight debris field, and heavy post-crash fire. Classic low altitude stall signature. The engine was running normally, both magnetos tested functional, and there was zero evidence of a mechanical failure. The flight controls were intact before impact. So early in the investigation, the NTSB already knew. This wasn't about a failed machine. It was about performance and aerodynamics. The plane had simply stopped flying. That's when the question shifted from what broke to why couldn't it climb? That answer came from one of the two survivors, Devin Farrell. In his statement to investigators, he said something that changed the entire narrative. He didn't ask for my weight. I never saw him calculate anything. That single comment told investigators almost everything they needed to know. After recovering the wreckage, the NTSB ran the numbers, and the result was eye-opening. The Cessna's takeoff weight that day was about 2,424 pounds. That's 224 pounds over the airplane's certified maximum. Now on paper, that might not sound huge, but in a light aircraft, that's a 10% overload. And that 10% can mean the difference between climbing away and stalling right off the runway. Worse yet, the center of gravity, the airplane's balance point, was beyond the rear limit. That means the aircraft was tail heavy. When the CG is too far aft, the plane becomes twitchy in pitch. Even a small back pressure on the yoke can send the nose too high. 
and once it's up there, it's harder to bring it back down. So combine all that. A hot day, a fully fueled airplane, four adults on board, tail heavy balance, and a low altitude turn. That's not just bad luck, that's an aerodynamic trap. But it wasn't the biggest mistake. Don't get me wrong, flying overweight is dangerous, but the real killer was not knowing it in the first place. The failure wasn't just in the math, it was in the mindset. Macron didn't weigh, didn't calculate, didn't check, it was routine. And that routine confidence, the belief that it'll fly fine, it always does, that's what quietly sealed their fate. So let's pull back for a second and look at this from a physics standpoint, because this is where the truth hides. When you fly overweight, everything changes, and not in your favor. The stall speed rises, meaning the wings need more airflow, more speed, just to stay flying. At the same time, your climb rate drops, because the wings and engine are working overtime just to keep you level. Now, throw in the aft center of gravity. That's like balancing a seesaw too far back. The airplane's nose naturally wants to pitch up, and the tail doesn't have enough authority to push it down. So when Macron pulled back just a little too much, that tail-heavy balance exaggerated it. The nose climbed, speed bled off, and lift started to die. And remember, that hot Florida air, 31 degrees Celsius. On a day like that, air density goes down. Thinner air means less oxygen for the engine, less lift for the wings, and less propeller thrust. It's called high-density altitude and it quietly kills performance. The old 145 horsepower engine on that 1957 Cessna wasn't built to handle those conditions at that weight. Even though the engine was roaring, and witnesses said it sounded strong, the airplane was physically incapable of climbing. It was flying at full power, but the lift just wasn't there. So while from the ground it looked like something must have gone wrong, in reality everything was working exactly as the laws of physics dictated. The plane didn't fail, it simply reached the edge of what it could do. If you were to graph it out, lift versus weight, or angle of attack versus airspeed, you'd see how close that line was to the cliff. One tiny input, one small pitch up too much, and there's no coming back. That's the brutal truth of flying overloaded. It's not that you're guaranteed to crash, it's that the margin for survival disappears. Now here's the part that hits deeper, because this accident isn't just about physics, it's about human behavior. Randy McCrone wasn't reckless. He wasn't some untrained thrill seeker. He was a professional law enforcement officer, a helicopter pilot, and a man who'd spent his life around aviation. He knew the rules. But here's the hard truth. Experience can create comfort, and comfort can dull caution. This flight wasn't a mission. It wasn't work. It was casual. No flight plan. No performance briefing. No checklists pulled out. Just a quick, let's take a ride kind of day. And that's what makes it so familiar, because a lot of pilots have been there. That attitude of, it's just around the patch, what could go wrong? It's everywhere in general aviation, and that's the trap. The more times you get away with bending small rules, the more your brain tells you it's safe. That's what we call the normalization of deviance. It's not arrogance, it's psychology. Over time, you start to trust your gut more than your checklist. There's also a bit of social pressure baked into this. Flying friends, family, showing confidence. The pilot doesn't want to look uncertain or hesitant in front of his passengers. So even if something feels off, that little voice in your head says, it's fine. I've done this before, but physics doesn't care how confident you look. It doesn't care that you're a veteran officer or a seasoned pilot. The numbers are merciless. Exceed them, and they'll bite. That's why this accident hits such a nerve. Because it's not about skill, it's about discipline. And discipline, especially in casual flying, is the first thing to slip. The NTSB's conclusion was painfully simple. The pilot's failure to perform a pre-flight weight and balance calculation and operation above maximum gross weight, leading to an aerodynamic stall. No mystery, no hidden mechanical flaw, just one skipped step, but that step cost two lives. This wasn't fate. It was a chain of tiny invisible decisions that built up over time, small moments of trust, habit, and comfort that quietly stacked against the pilot. It's a reminder that in aviation, danger doesn't always come from storms or equipment failures. Sometimes it's the easy flights, the perfect weather flights that carry the biggest trap. Because every time we skip the checklist, every time we say it'll be fine, we trade safety for convenience, and physics doesn't take trades. Calhoun County felt that loss deeply. Randy McCrone and Steve Mears weren't just names on a report. They were fathers, friends, 
pillars of a small community that never expected to lose them this way. Their families and co-workers built memorials. Schools held vigils. The human cost went far beyond the runway. So, if there's one takeaway from this story, it's this. Every flight deserves respect. Do the math. Check the balance. Don't assume the numbers. Confirm them. Because in aviation, the hardest lessons are always written in fire. If you found this breakdown insightful, hit that like button. It really helps the channel. And subscribe for more crash analyses where we dig into not just what happened, but why it happened and what we can all learn from it.